Let us prepare our hearts for worship during the prelude. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Keith Hammer. I'm a retired uh, ELCA pastor. I'm a member here at Redeemer Lutheran in Boise. This morning, uh, I welcome all of you who are gathering with us either here uh, in church or wherever you are joining us, whenever you are joining us. Uh, members of Redeemer, uh, Grace Horseshoe Bend, and others who join us today. Today is the third Sunday of Easter. We follow the narrative lectionary in our worship services, and I make note of a change that happens this morning. I don't know if you've noticed it, but from the Sunday after Christmas until last Sunday, we have been following texts from the Gospel of John on which this part of the narrative lectionary cycle is based. But today we depart for the rest of the year until Pentecost. And for today and two Sundays following, we will be focusing on Saul's journey, Paul, and the book of Acts. Then we will focus on three Sundays from Philippians. And finally, on the last Sunday also, 
because it is Pentecost Sunday, hear the Pentecost story from Acts. On a later Sunday this month, we'll tell you what's in store for the summer. Uh, meanwhile, if you're following uh, the lectionary in your readings during the week, please continue to do so. We are in our worship together in step three, which means we can sing without masks. We have uh, live music for all of our hymns. Uh, not practicing social distancing unless you choose to do so, and sharing the peace in whatever way is comfortable to you. As you can see, we're celebrating Holy Communion today. If you're watching at home, it would be a good time to go if you have not already done so and gather bread or a cracker and some juice or wine. If you're well worshiping with us here in person, we will celebrate with bread and wine uh, that will be distributed from the aisle in front. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! Alleluia! Christ is risen! Let us rise and sing our opening hymn, number 392, the first three verses. Let us pray. Mysterious Lord, you choose and use the most unlikely people for your work. Show us the path you have prepared for us and give us all your strength and courage to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated.
Open for us, O God, the words of the witnesses, received by the faithful and handed on to us. Make us free to hear and not hold back that we may live in the joy of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, who calls us by our name. Now the word of God, reading from Acts chapter 9. Glory to you, Lord. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and ate, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here am I, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying and he has seen a vision that a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The word of the Lord. You have just heard the uh, story of Saul, who later became Paul, and his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Whereas you've just heard Saul was going to round up followers of the way that was followers of Jesus and bring them back to be Jerusalem, either to be jailed or possibly either even killed. 
Remember that Paul, Saul, was there at the stoning of Stephen. This is a familiar story to many of us. The theme from this story, which I would like to give our attention to this morning, is what I call everyday visions. Our focus will be on the visions of two people in this story. One is Saul on his way to Damascus, and the other is Ananias. As we note in the story, they have different kinds of visions. Saul seems to be more on what we would say is the supernatural side. But both men are guided by their visions into living lives that God wants them to live and intended for them to live. Now, importantly, I think before we start, we need to understand what we're talking about when we talk about vision. So here's the, de the, de the definition of vision that I choose for this morning. It is the ability to think about and plan the future with imagination or wisdom. The ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or vision. And my contention is that each one of us, each and every one of us, have these kinds of visions every day. What I'm talking about is what you have in mind to do today when you jump, roll, or drag yourself out of bed in the morning. It could be the appointment calendar that you carry on your cell phone, or it could be if you like to make to-do lists, that it's your to-do list for the day, or even if you don't get that far, the to-do list that is tumbling around there in your mind. These are the things that we are talking about when I say your everyday visions. Now, one of the things that is really important to note about these visions is that when you start to add up all of your appointments, when you start to add up all of your to-do lists, you begin to see what is important in your life and what kind of a person you are or are becoming. In Saul's case, his appointments had to do with getting to Damascus and start rounding up Christians. In Ananias' case, well, we really don't know what his plans for the day were. We just know that in the middle of the day, he got a surprise, an interruption of whatever his plans were. Roger von Eck wrote a book called A Whack in the Side of the Head. In the minds of many, it's a classic for stimulating creativity. Now listen how it begins. It begins with the idea that if somebody comes along and gives you a whack in the side of the head, strong enough, hard enough, so that it knocks you out for a moment, that when you revive, you might start doing something differently, like you forgot what you were doing, so you might start doing something new and experience having new ideas in your life. Now, please note one thing for sure. Neither the author nor I am advocating to anyone that you give yourself or anyone else a whack in the side of the head for the purpose of bringing change in their life. You might say, though, that Saul's experience on the road to Damascus was his whack in the side of the head. Because whatever happened there, we would probably put it in the realm of, quote, supernatural. You know, the idea of the blinding light and the voice that other people heard from God, that it was something that changed his life. And he was physically blinded, so much so that the people who were with him had to take him by the hand and lead him to where he was going. 
I suspect for Saul, who seemed to be quite a proud man, this was a very humbling experience. Of course, of course, there's more to the story, much more. Raj Nadella, a seminary teacher who comments on this story, notes particularly that the voice in Saul's everyday vision said to him, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now, think about this for a moment. Another way of saying this might be, I am Jesus speaking for those who are voiceless to you. I want you to give them your attention and respect. For certainly all of these Christians that Paul, Saul, Saul was persecuting didn't have a voice to him. And in Saul's case, what happened there on the road would change his life. Yet, how could we imagine it any other way than that this was a major disruption in his life? Now, I suspect many of us, most of us have had those kinds of experiences in our life, and I'm not gonna try to guess what they are, but if you can latch onto one for a moment this morning, if you think about it, you might be saying and thinking at the time it was happening the same thing that no doubt Paul was thinking, Saul was thinking. I haven't got time for this. I've got so much to do. I've got to get on with what I need to do, like rounding up and killing Christians. Yikes! I doubt that if any of you who are listening to me this morning, either here in church or online, have that on your to-do list for the day or any time. If Jesus, though, were to disrupt your everyday visions, your daily appointments or your to-do lists, for whom might he be speaking? Possibly your family? because they don't see you because you spend too many hours working? Maybe your church, because there's so many other important things to do on the weekend, <laughs> I've got time for them all. Or whenever you're invited to engage in service, the same is true. Or maybe your city or community organization, service organization, when they need someone who would give thoughtful input and a helping hand in a facing a difficult issue. Or maybe the refugees and migrants of the world because, well, huh, it's all so overwhelming. How could it be that my participation in the solution might make any difference? Who will take you by the hand and lead you and guide you through an overwhelming time and lead you to God's place of safety? Like God did for Saul, God finds a way and sends persons to help. I recall a time earlier in my life, I was going through a divorce at the time I was serving as an interim pastor and uh, Hear me, and, uh, and I know this is the story of many, not, not only pastors, everybody who's ever had that experience. They never could have imagined that was going to happen to them, and then to be pastor leading a congregation and thinking about how would people receive it, I thought for sure that they would be quite judgmental toward me. Instead, what happened was just the opposite. I experienced their love and understanding and helping me through a very difficult time in my life. They were Ananias's to me. Because you see, Ananias is the other person in this story who has everyday visions. Ananias's everyday vision seemed more ordinary than the vision Paul had. He saw no blinding light or heard a voice from heaven. 
Rather, he hears an inner voice that he recognizes as the voice of God. Words, as we try to describe what that is, fail us sometimes, and we don't know how to say what they are. Perhaps, though, they might be as concrete as a phone call from somebody who asks for our help. Or they may be that voice, like it seemed that Ananias experienced inside of us, that just keeps saying to us, this person needs your help. This situation needs your attention. Go, go, go. And finally, we respond. And reach out and see if we can help. For many of us, these kinds of everyday visions may be more like interruptions or surprises to the plans we have for the day. Sometimes we, like Ananias, just finally give in to them and say, okay, I'll do it. And as the saying goes, let go and let God guide us in our response. Note, however, one thing here, Ananias protested vigorously when God asked him to go and help Paul, Saul. He had heard of what Saul had done in the past and he knew that he might be walking right into his own arrest for bounding, fighting, and trip back to Jerusalem. You and I, when we are pressed by the deepening awareness in our lives that God is moving us to action, may feel similar kinds of protests within us. How are we to let go and let God, and God let God guide us to service? Perhaps it might be helpful to think of it this way. I suspect that many of you, as you are hearing this message today, will be thinking something like this. I can identify several situations in my life where I could be useful to God's purposes. Some of them I am already, already doing or trying to do or, or responding to. But then I come to this person or situation, and I'm not, again, going to try to name it, but I think that some of us can begin to think of those people in our lives who really are our thorns in the flesh, or that's what we think they are. And you say, not that person, not that situation. No, 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 we protest, like Ananias did. But it is that situation of which we are speaking right now. What can we do for that person? What can we do for that situation? Well, we can think of some things. We can probably keep on praying. We've already done that. We can also think of other actions we can take. Perhaps it's writing a note or a card. Perhaps it is finally picking up the phone and giving them a call. Perhaps it's even finding a way to go and say, can we sit down and talk? Ananias did as the inner voice of God directed him, and he became God's servant in setting Paul in a whole new direction in his life. He wasn't a whack, but he was a faithful servant. God can use our responses to everyday visions in similar ways. So I hope this morning that this story of Saul on Damascus Road and how Ananias became a faithful servant in that story will prod you to pay attention to your own everyday visions. Your appointment calendars, your to-do lists, our responses to the voices of God inside of us really do reveal what's important in our lives and the kinds of persons we are becoming. Moreover, as we discover life and Christian community in our churches after the pandemic, these everyday visions become crucial 
to a life-giving future that grows in love and service. We have been using Fun X words whacked in the side of the head probably more than once and very hard. But we are here and we are faithful. And as we wake up, we can discover new life, sitting and looking into each other's faces, sharing our everyday visions, perhaps sometimes unlearning what has drained life from our life together in the past and discovering what that future God has for us that is open for us now to live, to receive and to live. Today, as we come to the table and receive God's gifts in the bread and the wine, we are assured of God's love and forgiveness that God very much wants us to be guided by our everyday visions that God gives us. Amen. Let us sing together the hymn number 715. Let us pray. Risen Lord, we offer these prayers of love on behalf of the church, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures, ourselves and our neighbors. Gracious God, our refuge and strength, we pray for peace among all nations especially in Ukraine. We pray for courage and hope for all people facing the terrors of war and ask you to guide us to use our gifts in cooperation with others to provide hope in any way. Risen Lord, God of creation, while parts of the world are still struggling with winter storms, 
Our region is facing another season of drought, drought and wildfire. Open our eyes to the ways we can be part of the solution to climate change while we have a chance to make a difference and heal the wounds of the earth. Risen Lord, God of hope and healing, give us strength to bring light to those who care for others, to comfort those in mourning, to stand with those who are sick or suffering in any way. Share your mercy and love. You know the needs of those on our prayer lists and those we name at this time. We ask you to hold them and bring them healing and peace. Risen Lord, Mighty and merciful God, you have provided us with everything we need to carry out the work before us. Accept our prayers and fortify us for the days to come. Amen. Now I invite you, if you wish, to stand and we will share the peace. Please do that in any way that you are comfortable doing so. Let's rise. We are joined in the offering prayer. When we have emptied ourselves all that consumes us, then we are fit to be your servants, O God. Bring us before your altar with humility. 
eager to hear your word and offer back to you our thanksgiving. Bless these gifts that they may pray by spreading goods. Amen. Let us sing the hymn number 469. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O oh God, most holy. O oh God, most merciful. O oh God, our rock and our salvation. Hear us as we praise. Call to your table. Grant us life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Sarah and Abraham were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath, and the psalmist cried out for healing. And full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, We plead, amen. Amen. O God, you are breath. Send your spirit on this meal. O God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. 
O God, most majestic. O God, most motherly. O God, our strength and our song show us a vision of a tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son and the Spirit, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior. Live life in you, now and forever. And together we cry, Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We know and believe that Christ is truly present here. In these simple gifts, in the mystery of bread and wine, Christ's body and blood are given for you. All are welcome at God's table, Christ's table of grace, to know Jesus' presence and to receive God's forgiveness. Come now, for the banquet is ready. For those of you who are communing at home, as we begin communion, I will first of all Say the words for you. Do I have a helper? given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us pray together. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, go in peace, for you have found life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 393, the first two verses.
Oh, you saw Mike? I saw Mike.